Warren Smith. It, it wasn't me. It was Pastor Dwight Doval in Appleton, Wisconsin. And you'll tell the whole story. <laughs> I just got to read this right away after Roger's very uh, excellent talk. As an ex-New Ager, the bottom line in the New Age is God is in everything. And uh, that's the bottom foundational lie that is trying to upend uh, traditional biblical Christianity. You don't really need to know anything other than that because if you, you'll see it everywhere. I've got a, a book let called Be Still and Know That You're Not God. And that booklet traces the history of how it's leached its way in through the New Age, through Oprah, through the shack, through Purpose Driven Life, through uh, uh, Jesus Calling. It's, it's all in there. When you see that, uh-oh, problem, that's the, fa- the new foundation of Psalm 11.3, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? If that foundation is destroyed, then all the world can come together as one with that false foundation, which will be like the foundation of sinking sand in that Jesus talked about in Matthew 6. But here's one reason and one reason alone to know that there's a counter-reformation and it's just waiting to happen. I'm going to read to you from the 1994 Vatican II, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, their doctrine. Number 795, let us rejoice then and give thanks that we have become not only Christians, but Christ himself. Do you understand and grasp, brethren, God's grace toward us? Marvel and rejoice, we have become Christ. Number 460, for the Son of God became man so that we might become God. Number 460, again, the same section, the only begotten Son of God, wanting to make us shares in his divinity, assumed our nature so that he made man might make men gods. Excuse me, Kenneth Copeland. Excuse me, James Robeson. Excuse me, everyone else who's saying that we have everything in common with the Catholic Church. That alone tells you, I mean, and there's so many other reasons that Roger put up there. Just when I saw this for the first time, I just, but what's going to happen will be like my friend uh, who's a Catholic. I read this to her. and I said, Jenny, what's your response? She said, I'm stunned. But you know what's going to happen? The average Catholic will go, well, oh, that's interesting. But it's the catechism of the Catholic Church, and the Pope approves it. I'll tell you something interesting. In my book, False Christ Coming, Does Anybody Care? Maitreya. How many are familiar with who? Anybody heard of Maitreya? Okay. Maitreya is saying that he is Christ and he is here on earth right now waiting for humanity to call him forth. He made his announcement, I think, way back in 1982. Benjamin Krem is kind of like his John the Baptist. Krem and Maitreya said that when Christ comes, that's Maitreya, when he appears, the counterfeit of the angels that will come with Jesus, he says the masters of wisdom will come with me. And he said, these, some of these masters of wisdom are in the world already. There is the master Jesus. In other words, the master Jesus isn't the Christ. Maitreya, or if Maitreya is the prototype, the prototype for Antichrist, when Antichrist comes, he'll come with his masters of wisdom, one of whom will be the master Jesus. And what Krem and Maitreya said is that the master Jesus will occupy the throne of St. Peter in Rome. We might be looking at that very figure right now. I don't think we to, to just say that's it or whatever, but I mean, all these things are playing out. Everything's coming into play. And what we're being basically told by the deceptive forces is that all things are coming together as one. And as we'll see, they're trying to use quantum physics, and that's warned about in 1 Timothy 6, 19 to 21. Science falsely so-called, some have erred concerning the faith. What, what was God's response to all this? You know, well, Isaiah fifty four fifteen. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Or how about in Genesis 11? Now that this people is one, there's nothing that can be restrained from their imagination, and he scatters them over the face of the earth. Folks, the way is narrow, and few there be that find it. Oneness, this worldwide unity, is the broad way. And Jesus said that the broad way leads to destruction. 
It sounds exclusivistic, but it's really not because anybody's free to choose to follow Jesus Christ. But Jesus, knowing the future, saw that that wasn't going to be the case. It's going to be a narrow way, few there be that find it. It's very discouraging for a lot of people to hear all these things that are coming upon us. But to me, it's very encouraging to know that we've been warned about all this. I mentioned last night that when I was reading Johanna Michelson's book, The Beautiful Side of Evil, in a bookstore and having my eyes open for the first time, a homeless mentally ill guy that was on the street came in and started screaming at me and asking me why I was reading that book. I'm reading scripture for the first time. <laughs> the light that was dark. <laughs> that was my first book. So here I am, this guy's screaming. I mean, are you going to buy that book? What are you? And I, I'm realizing for the first time, not only is there evil, but evil can be orchestrated to try to interfere and to keep me from reading about it. And what I've said in a couple of circumstances is that I was persecuted before I was a Christian. So what do you think it's going to be like for us? Well, we're going to stand because the Lord's going to enable us to stand, just like the disciples did. And we're not going to be concerned about all this. But I know for myself, and I know speaking for some of the, Johanna Michelson's here with us today, Carol Tertiana's here with us today, others that have been through the New Age, uh, Will Barron's here with us today. We understand that there is a tremendous persecution that comes against us, but we understand that the word of God has described it all and that we just are so grateful for that. As a matter of fact, I wanted to start off by quoting from 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift, 2 Corinthians 9, 15. This is just the way it is, but the thing I was starting to say is that I think a lot of us, the warnings have gone out for a long, long time. I don't know how much longer they're going to keep going out. And what I felt really inclined to do over the last year is to do some little booklets, and you'll see some of them on my table. Lighthouse Trails has, I think, about 80 booklets now. And... The ones that I've done to supplement what's wrong is kind of like what's right. And uh, here are some of the titles that I've done over the last year. Being thankful through it all. Praising God through it all. Keeping God's word through it all. Rejoicing through it all. Being blessed through it all. Remaining hopeful through it all. Standing fast through it all. I think we're at that stage where we can't just, we need to know what's going on. And we need to have people that update us on what's happening. But we need to get prepared it's kind of like we're waiting for the storm. We're waiting for the, there's things happening. And I'm watching the church, and we're not getting no warnings that I'm aware of from any major leader about anything except a revival that's coming, about all these good things that are coming. And it was interesting in that quote that Copeland did about unity, it's endeavoring to keep the unity. Endeavoring. We try to keep the unity, but we do not compromise the truth to establish unity. And there's a lot of teachers out there, a lot of people, a lot of popular Christian figures that are really, it's unity, 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 and there's no warnings about this false teaching of God and everyone that's coming about. And one other just little footnote, the New Age, and, and one of the top New Age leaders, Barbara Marks Hubbard, who was actually nominated for vice president at the 1984 Democratic National Convention, Barbara Marks Hubbard said that she heard from Christ and that there's going to be a planetary Pentecost. This is in the New Age writings. We're hearing nothing of this from Beth Moore or any of the other figures that are talking about this revival that's coming, this spiritual awakening that's going to be taking over in the world. There's no warning about this planetary Pentecost. A good booklet would be Planetary Pentecost or planetary holocaust. Because that's what we're looking at if this thing keeps going the way that it's going. 1 Corinthians 14, 8, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? We're not hearing any warnings. We're just hearing all this upbeat distraction 
from Christian leaders. We're having these big crusades where millions of people are, not millions, but countless people are coming forward. But we're not hearing about, you know, some of the things that have leached their way into the church. I told this story last night. I was at a uh, Sierra Telephone uh, place where they, you know, have copying machines and computers and stuff. And there was a group of people that were just laughing hilariously over in the corner. And I couldn't help myself. I went over and I said, what's so funny? They said, tell him, George, whatever his name was. He said, well, he says, I went to my ATM at my bank and I took out some money. And then I went into the bank to pay off, I think it was a truck. And they started to do that. And then the, the teller said, oh, I'm sorry, but I, I can't take this. This is counterfeit. He said, I just got it from you. I just got it out of your ATM machine. And they, 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 they couldn't believe it. They rolled the tape. And sure enough, there he was. And he walked into the bank. We're getting counterfeit within the church now. It used to be, you know, the, the Johanna Michelsons and Carol Matricianas and, and the, the Dave Hunts and, and the rest were warning about the new age that was out there trying to get into the church. Now we have things that are in the church. We have a false Christ in the book Jesus Calling in the church. I'll be talking about that later if, I've, if somebody's reading Jesus Calling and they're concerned. I'll be glad to explain that um, and you're free to take any booklet that I've got on Jesus Calling. So things are happening very fast, but we need to stay rooted in God's word. We need to stand fast. I know somebody read my book, False Christ Coming, Does Anybody Care?, and sent me an email and said, you know, I read your book, and it was scary. It was horrifying to read what the New Age leaders have laid out, what could be coming down. But she said, somehow I was comforted. And the reason she was comforted is because God's word is in that book because God has warned us about the things to come. We've got Christian leaders like Leonard Sweet who are saying that the world is on the cusp of the world's greatest spiritual awakening. There's just nothing to indicate that. They're trying to use Joel 2 to, to prove that. Jesus said, when asked, what will be the sign of your return the end of the age? He said, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. Deception was the very first thing that he mentioned. There was a singer way back in the 60s. Few people here might remember Johnny Rivers. In one of his songs, he said, hey, friend, wake up. Can't you tell that you're sleeping? How far can you go with unopened eyes? Treating your mind like it was some kind of plaything. You're sleeping on a feather bed of lies. You know, I, I heard that song sometime over the last year, and I went, wow, what a metaphor, a feather bed of lies. A feather bed of lies sounds really good. You know, the devil can make you feel really good about things that are bad, and he can make you feel really bad about things that are good. Psalm 144, it talks about the right hand of falsehood. The right hand of falsehood. The right hand of fellowship in Galatians 2.9 is, you know, what we extend to one another in the faith. The right hand of falsehood is a counterfeit. It looks, it has a form of godliness, but denies the power thereof. The right hand of falsehood, that's really, that's like a feather bed of lies. That's what we're getting. We're getting a lot of misinformation about what's in the Bible. And we need to know, we need to know the word and we need to stand on the word. And I think our biggest witness in the future, it's just like what uh, Jim Fletcher said earlier. He said, the proof, the burden is on them to prove their case. We simply say, no, you know, this is what the Bible says. Matthew 13, 25, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. It's been done. It's been going on for a long time. I've been in the faith now 32 years, and I was reading the works of you know, Johanna and Carol and Dave Hunt and others back in the 80s. I mean, Johanna was on, weren't you on Oprah Winfrey, Johanna? She was on Oprah Winfrey back when Oprah Winfrey would let another point of view on her program. It used to be they'd have the New Agers here and they'd have the, the Christians here and they would, now it's just whoever Oprah wants to have, you know, come. Ephesians 5, 14 to 20, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. So what's happened? What, what's gone wrong? 
Isaiah 5, 1 to 4, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it. And also made a wine press therein and he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. That's what we're looking at. Rodney Howard Brown, holy laughter. Bill Johnson, Bethel Church. We need to have an encounter with Jesus. I think we've all had that encounter, and we have the word of God. We don't need to have some kind of an experiential happening for him to prove himself to us. I think a lot of these people don't have much faith and they need to have some kind of a spiritual event. At UC Davis, University of California Davis, uh, about a year ago I think it was, they had a conference with Jesus Culture and a lot of the New Apostolic Reformation people. One encounter changes everything. Anybody that's read my book, The Light That Was Dark, everything changed when I tried to please a waitress that I was trying to date by seeing a psychic and a ball of light manifested over my head. I was told I had a lot of help on the other side. Loved ones that had passed on, angels, spirits that were interested in my world. Everything changed. I went flying into the new age. One encounter changes everything. Lying signs and wonders are going to change a lot of things. And we were warned about that in 2 Thessalonians. Why? Because people perished because they did not have a love of the truth. They did not believe the truth. They believed their experiences. In the New Age, our experiences proved our faith. The heart is deceitful above all else. Jeremiah 24.2 talked about naughty figs. We're looking at a lot of naughty figs. We're looking at a lot of wild grapes. Jeremiah 2.21, Yet I had planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. And, then, and then, how then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? And then Isaiah 17.10-11, because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, has not been mindful of the rock of thy strength, therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants, and set it with strange slips. In the day shalt thou make thy plant to grow, and in the morning shalt thou make thy seed to flourish, but the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and desperate sorrow. Strange slips like God in everyone. Strange slips like the dead are now communicating with the living. So how has this thing gone wrong? Um, I'd like to read to you from a book called Have Heart, Bridging the Gulf Between Heaven and Earth, Steve and Sarah Berger. Steve Berger is a, a pastor who was once a Calvary Chapel pastor here in Southern California, and he's now a, Philly, a, a Calvary affiliate in uh, Leapers Fork, Tennessee, outside of Nashville. Uh, the Burgers had an extremely tragic thing happen to them. Their son, Josiah, died in an in a automobile accident. It was a hor it's a horrible thing. Anybody that's lost a child knows just how devastating that is. This book was brought to my attention by a woman who helped to establish this church and who has since left um, totally disillusioned by what's going on in this church. Steve Berger is one of the uh, ones that's in the endorsing, endorsement section of the shack. Uh, Steve Berger passed out, you know, cases of Jesus calling to his congregation. And he's written this book, this book, Have Heart. And I just want to read to you this one particular section. He says, um, this particular night was a worship service, and our friend Rita Springer was serving as a guest worship leader. Jim and his wife were in the back of the sanctuary. Uh, Jim recalls, and uh, Jim Sterling is the, uh, was the assistant pastor working with Steve Berger. So this story, it says, Jim recalls, Rita began playing the song, It's Gonna Be Worth It. The song really touched me and took me to a deeper place with the Lord. There were many, many times in the hospital when we were at Josiah's bed praying, God, this better be worth it. So hearing this song took me back to that place. As I was listening, I was praying, and I asked God one more time, Lord, is it worth it? The next thing I knew, Josiah came into the sanctuary. Josiah is deceased at this particular time. Josiah came into the sanctuary. It wasn't like he just appeared there. It was a sense of him coming into the aisle, and he got down on one knee and bent to speak into my ear. He said, 
way worth it, Mr. Jim. Then as quickly as he came, he left. It wasn't that he dis disappeared, rather it was a sense of him leaving the sanctuary. It was as Josiah as Josiah could be. He was dressed in a white t-shirt and white knee-length shorts, and his hair was white like when he was a young boy. He had a sense of speed about him, and not that he was hurried, but as, but, but as if his life on earth was much slower than in heaven. It's a different place, a different plane. I stood up and went over to my wife and told her, Josiah was just here. Then Berger says, Pastor Jim and Josiah have been friends for a long time. Josiah's special name for him is Mr. Jim. Few people knew that. This visit proves that our loved ones in heaven are spiritually active and that they care. They are aware of the times that we need special encouragement. Josiah saw his friend tired, questioning, and drained, and God granted Josiah permission to make an appearance to encourage and reassure him. Jim was comforted by Josiah's visit, and it serves as proof that our son is not dead and gone, but merely moved to a different place to do other things for God. It shows he is happy there, and it demonstrates his continued presence in not only our lives, but in the lives of his friends as well. While rejoicing about the story, we told Rita Springer about Jim's experience. She was the, worship, the one guest worship leader that night, and she let us know about a special prayer request she made before worship began that night. She simply asked God, Father, could Siah come and worship with us tonight? God answered her prayer. Josiah was near to the moment and gave Jim encouragement and hope. Yes, the residents of heaven are personally present. They are aware and they are near. Have heart. Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 12, necromancy. We do not communicate with the dead. A woman called up on pastor's perspective and talked with Brian Broderson and with uh, Don, help me. Okay and asked about this book without naming the title and asked what their opinion was. Was this a major thing or a minor thing? Don said it's a major thing. And he quoted from Deuteronomy. So what I would like to know is why Greg Laurie endorsed this book in the front of the book. Here's his endorsement. Steve and Sarah Berger have faced the worst tragedy imaginable, the tragic death of their son Josiah. There are no words to describe the pain and sense of loss a parent feels when they've lost a child. Greg Glory lost a child. And, and again, who would not be sympathetic with that? But excuse me, you don't express your sympathy for another couple who's lost their child by endorsing having the dead come and communicate with us. By the way, this is total new age. Remember, when I saw the psychic, she said, you have a lot of help on the other side. I said, what's the other side? She said, loved ones, you have a lot of help on the other side. Loved ones that have passed on, they want to help you in your life. In James Redfield's book, The Twelfth Insight, a very uh, best-selling New Age book, it's made very clear in this novel that those on the other side have all the information that we need. They're trying to communicate to us. We've got books where, you know, young children are traveling to heaven and coming back with reports Heaven is, according to Bethel Church and Reading, invading earth. No. I want to read the rest of Greg Laurie's thing just because, to be fair. To, to say that your world changes forever is an understatement of epic proportions. I know because our son also died. In fact, it was through our mutual loss that my wife and I became friends with the Burgers. In their new book, Have Heart, Steve and Sarah write candidly of what they've experienced. And yet, despite the very real pain they live with each and every day, this book bursts with hope. While no one ever gets over the death of a child, the Burgers are going through this experience with more than their faith intact. As you will read, their faith is deeper, their insights are more penetrating, and their hope is bright with the expectation of seeing their beloved son again. I trust this book will be a blessing to you. You know, Greg Laurie does a lot of really good work for the Lord. I mean, just recently, a lot of people have come forward and accepted the Lord at a crusade. But then they'll see a book like this in the bookstore and they'll go, oh, wow, I accepted the Lord with Greg Laurie and he endorsed this book. And pretty soon they're talking to their dead loved ones. And if they're like Sarah Young with Jesus Calling, you know, they're going to get, oh, it, this isn't my dead loved one. I'm talking to Jesus. You have to test the spirits. Johanna Michelson had a spirit guide named Jesus Christ. When she tested the spirit in her meditation laboratory, 1 John 4, 1, that Jesus Christ left. Her laboratory exploded and it left. 
This stuff is real slick. The devil has been underestimated by the church. Rick Warren in The Purpose Driven Life says it helps to know that Satan is entirely predictable. Well, thanks, Rick. That's a big help. You know, that's like, that's like a football coach saying, hey, we know that team, we know, that, we know their plays. Well, it's kind of funny to me that people call, like there was a, a pass that uh, Aaron Rodgers of the Green Bay Packers threw at the last three seconds of a game. And it was, they call it a Hail Mary pass. And he threw it way up in the air and his guy got it and they won the game. And I just think it's funny that it was a Hail Mary pass. We, Every team protects against Hail Mary types of stuff. The church needs to protect itself for Hail Mary Catholic New Age coming into the evangelical, evangelical church. This stuff is happening. Front cover endorsement. Who did we see in Roger's clip with Kenneth Copeland? James Robeson. James Robeson, front cover of Half Heart. The burgers show us how we can find light and life beyond death's shadow. Who appears on James Robeson's program every Wednesday? Beth Moore. What is Beth Moore doing on James Robeson's program when James Robeson has Paul Young, the author of The Shack on the show, and raves about his book, saying we have everything in common with Catholics, and, and endorsing a book on the front cover saying that we can communicate with our deceased loved ones? Worse yet, why has Beth Moore affirmed or did she affirm on her June 26, 2009 blog that Eugene Peterson's message was a, quote, true translation and not a paraphrase, paraphrase, emphasizing that it's, quote, unquote, an absolutely beautiful translation. In spite of the fact that Peterson's alleged Bible is filled with poorly translated verses, many of which convey Peterson's own personal contemplative, mystical, New Age stuff. Here's an example of Eugene Peterson's beautiful book that Beth Moore recommends so highly to, to her countless uh, faithful. You can look this up yourself. Proverbs 24, 21 in the King James. My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change, for their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? Meddle not with them given to change. What does Rick Warren describe himself as? A change agent. I mean, basically, we're being told in Proverbs, meddle not with change agents. They're trying to change things. Okay, what does the message say? Eugene Peterson, sitting at home, perhaps with a cup of coffee, maybe with his feet up on the coffee table, decides to rewrite the Bible. Jesus, in, in encountering the temptations from the devil, said, it is written. Eugene Peterson takes the liberty to say, it is rewritten by me. Outrageous. Do you ever see the numbers of people that use the message, that endorse the message? And I'm not trying to pick on Greg Laurie again, but he quotes from the message all the time. I don't trust people that quote from the message. Here is what Eugene Peterson wrote. Fear God, dear child. Respect your leaders. Don't be defiant or mutinous. Without warning, your life can turn upside down, and who knows how or when it might happen. So instead of watch out for change agents and their life could get turned upside down. We're being told by Peterson, respect your leaders or your life could be turned upside down. Wow, he just turned that thing completely upside down. How about uh, 2 Peter 1.16, King James, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables like the shack, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. By the way, Eugene Peterson was on the front cover endorsing the shack. So does he talk about cunningly devised fables when he translates so-called 2 Peter 1.16? No, this is what Peterson comes up with. He dumps cunningly devised fables. He says, we weren't, you know, just wishing on a star when we laid the facts out before you regarding the powerful return of our master Jesus Christ. So the one scripture in King James skewers the shack. This one leads you to Pinocchio. I mean, that's, I think that's where Wishing on a Star came. It used to be the theme of Disneyland, for Pete's sakes. This is a form of godliness, but not only denying the power of, but changing God's word. There's other examples. I think that's adequate. So the question is, you know, why is Beth Moore hyping the message? What is she doing on James Robeson's program? 
And am I supposed to believe her when she says that God told her that revival is coming and that there will be those who will doubt that and watch out because those are the scoffers that the Bible warned about? Well, excuse me. I just don't trust somebody that's quoting from the message who's hooked up with James Robeson, who's hooking up with the Catholic Church, and she's also bringing Catholics in. This whole ecumenical movement is everything Jesus Christ warned us would happen in these days. It's happening right before our eyes, and it doesn't seem that anybody in leadership is really talking about it. Why? I don't know. But I can almost guarantee you that if they started to do it, they'd probably lose their ministry, and they probably know that. Here's a, a new emergent Bible that came out called The Voice. Contributions from Leonard Sweet and Brian McLaren and others that are big voices in the emerging church. 2 Peter 3.18, King James, But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Here's the voice. Instead, grow in grace and the true knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus, the anointed one to whom be all glory now and until the coming of the new age. In your face. Perhaps the most uh, graphic and disappointing example is Dr. David Jeremiah. And I'm not taking anything away from all the good things that he said or still teaches. But this man wrote a book in 1995 called Invasion of Other Gods, The Seduction of New Age Spirituality. He wrote it with a woman uh, by the name of C.C. C. Carlson. Here's some quotes from his book. So much has happened in our culture in recent years. And by the way, he had another book that had many of these same writings in it in 2002. We've heard nothing since 2002. He's got a book out right, or two books out right now, The Agents of the Apocalypse and The Agents of Babylon, and he doesn't name one of the people that he named in this book, but listen to what he said back then. So much has happened in our culture in recent years to introduce New Age spirituality that it's important to know who the players are and what they're saying, especially when some of them are found within the ranks of the church. Anyone who's been a Christian for a few decades can recognize significant changes in the church in America. What is the source of these changes? The New Age movement has breached the walls of the church. He said, we need theological and practical theists in our churches who will first live lives by the standard of the word of God. Second, we need them to stand on the wall and stand in the doorway of the church to keep New Age influences out. The purity of the church is a function of the purity of its members. The last time I heard Francis Schaeffer speak before he died, he left an indelible mark on in my life. I cannot tell you the topic upon which he spoke. I remember very little about this speech itself. What I do recall vividly is his love and concern for the churches and the people of this nation. Knowing there were preachers in the audience, he kept asking, where are the tears? Where is the brokenness and compassion for our nation that is forsaking God? Where are the tears? Forsaking God through New Age teachings would be a legitimate means for revival. True repentance rather than incorporating them into your revival, incorporating pagan elements that the Israelites were told to stay away from when they went into the Canaan land. You don't have revival by tag your it Christianity. Rodney Howard Brown, you know, walking by somebody and having them fall on the floor or touching somebody. Benny Johnson, uh, Bill Johnson's wife up in the Bethel Church in Reading, hyper charismatic uh, New Apostolic Reformation Church, Said she was really not doing well in her life. Went up to Toronto Vineyard. There was a guy walking around sort of like with this electric force, and he touched her, and her whole life changed. Do you see how this thing's going to work? People that don't know what's going on are going to suddenly, like myself, have a ball of light over their head going, whoa, okay, what, what do I do now? David Jeremiah says, I hope that I will be able to say with Paul that I have not ceased to teach what the word of God says, and I have sounded a warning. No, he hasn't. He stopped warning. He hasn't warned that I'm aware of for 14 years. Why? I don't know. At one time, he said in this book, I believe the new spirituality, the new age, is the greatest threat to the Christian worldview today. It's subtle and insidious, ready to catch us unaware. My warning is not from an academic viewpoint. It's with the passion of the Apostle Paul when he said, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Matthew 21, 28 to 31, there's the son who said he would go, but he didn't. John 8, 31, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. 
David Jeremiah has not continued in his warnings. I could not find invasion of other gods among the countless books he has on his website this morning when I looked. It's gone. In his book, he warned about Richard Foster. He quoted Norman Geisler saying that there are at least 15 areas of New Age Eastern things in Richard Foster's book, Celebration of Discipline. Yet Richard Foster shows up on a Be Still video with Beth Moore, and we have a big silence coming from Shadow Mountain Church. Well, we try to be fair. I talked to Johanna, I talked to Carol. I said, let's try to go down and talk to David Jeremiah and see what's going on. Maybe he just got completely distracted. Maybe somebody's twisted him around. Carol wrote a wonderful letter. Carol had contact with David Jeremiah in the past. As a matter of fact, in Jeremiah's 2002 book, The New Spirituality, here's what he says about Johanna. An expert on the New Age movement, Johanna Michelson, whose books I highly recommend, has said in growing numbers, okay, he highly recommends Johanna. He knows Carol. He probably doesn't know me, but Carol writes the letter and says, very, I mean, it's a beautiful letter the way she wrote it. She said, you know, you've done some really good warnings in the past, and we respect you, and, and Johanna and I... And uh, our friend, Warren, who came out of the New Age, would like to come down and talk with you about some of the things that are going on. I'm pretty sure it was almost two months before she finally got her reply. And the reply was, David Jeremiah will not be able to meet with you. Here's a guy who said he's going to sound the warning, and he won't even sit and talk with two women who he knows are experts who came out of the New Age and who could update him, who could tell him what's going on. I just, it's hard to have much respect for people who just, you know, we, we did everything we could to try to give him the, the benefit of the doubt. Why would he stop? And in his book, he talked about Dr. Bernie Siegel. He said, this is a new age doctor with a spirit guide named George. Who would who would get medical advice from a doctor who has a spirit guide named George? He says, it's amazing where you'll see Bernie Siegel's name. Airplanes, all these other places. Well, guess what? How did Rick Warren introduce hope and purpose in the Purpose Driven Life? He quoted Dr. Bernie Siegel. Yet David Jeremiah is on board with Rick Warren and his peace plan. If this doesn't make any sense to you, join me. I mean, it's like I don't have an explanation, except something's happened to David Jeremiah where he's not warning about these things anymore. Hardly anybody in leadership. So we stand up here doing all the things, naming names, trying to, you know, get, get people aware of these things, and yet there's this big silence in Christendom about this incredible deception that's going on. And now we're getting the drum roll for a false revival. Excuse me. They say it's a real revival. I say it's a false revival. There's nothing in the Bible to indicate anything except deception. Evil will wax worse and worse. When I was in the New Age, I used to say every day and every way things are getting better and better. Now I stand up here and say every day and every way things are getting worse and worse. That's just the way it is. But Jesus doesn't leave it at that. He gives us hope. He gives us an understanding of what's going on. We shouldn't, again, I come back to what Jim Fletcher was saying. We don't have to get defensive about this stuff. Excuse me. You know, it says deception is the chief sign of his soon coming. Oprah Winfrey says she's a Christian. She gets really angry when anybody infers that she's um, a New Ager. Joel Osteen welcomed Oprah Winfrey to his church on November 6, 2011. Oprah Winfrey's New Age Christianity is channeled from a false Christ through a, a psychologist that was at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, Helen Shookman. She heard an inner voice saying, this is A Course of Miracles, please take notes. She did, and the Jesus Christ of the Course in Miracles, which oh, I'm going to show this clip this afternoon, where Oprah Winfrey endorses and pushes the Course in Miracles on her show, 
This Christ says that the journey to the cross should be the last useless journey. Do not make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. A slain Christ has no meaning. Folks, this isn't Rick Warren's new age. Oh, the new age is baloney. No, this is, this is the breath of Antichrist. This is serious, serious stuff. This is everything we were warned about. So Joel Osteen looks out and sees Oprah out there, and he says, quote, awesome to have you. Uh, Oprah was there with her TV producer. We're so honored to have you both here, and we just celebrate and pray for you guys and what God is doing in your lives. Hey, Oprah's doing a lot of really good stuff, but she's doing some horrible stuff, really horrible stuff. Jeremiah was quoted last night by Chris, Pastor Chris, Jeremiah 5, 30, 31, a wonderful and a horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and my people love to have it so. What do they say about Oprah? She's wonderful. What's she teaching? It's horrible. What do people do? They love to have it. What does Daniel say about Antichrist? Daniel 8, 24, 25, he said he will destroy wonderfully. And then he says, by peace he shall destroy many. Folks, we're on the cusp of a worldwide false revival that's going to usher in Rick Warren's peace plan that's going to merge with everything else. And it's going to look like God is pulling humanity out of the fire at the last minute. Is that what the book of Revelation says? No. But Eugene Peterson says the book of Revelation is poetry. It's prophecy. From who? From Jesus Christ. By the way, there was another communique from Beth, Beth Moore. She was on her way to Joel Osteen's church to fellowship with, uh, with someone. They were going, they were going to, uh, to Joel Osteen's church. This thing's way out of hand. We've got people that have somehow become designated as leaders. And can we blame them? No. We put them there. These people are all there because they're telling people what they want to hear. I am so grateful that I was deceived as badly as I was because when I got it, every scripture in the Bible described what I'd been involved in. We came into the faith and we would go to churches. We didn't know the Bible. We just knew the deception. We knew the scriptures about deception because I had Johanna's book and I'd look through and I'd read enough. And I would go to a church with my wife and they would like, you know, the little old lady who's probably my age now say, well, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you know, do you know the Lord Jesus? Uh, yeah. Uh, how long have you been Christians? Well, about 30 days. Oh, well, how did you come to know them? Well, uh, there was uh, a lot of spiritual warfare, demonic spirits. We learned about the victory on the cross of Calvary, and we called upon that victory, and the spirits left. And, it, and the Bible just became, oh, uh, uh, Mabel, can you help these people, please? We'd get them some coffee or something. And we would do this church after church, and we would walk home, and we would go, we don't know anything about the Bible, but we know about the victory on the cross of Calvary. We, we know, you know, about the deception. Why doesn't the church know about it? And then we would, you know, I think the seduction of Christianity came out after that. And we, you know, there were, there were books. But I just read recently that Tom McMahon, who wrote that book with Dave Hunt, The Seduction of Christianity, he said that three years after they wrote that book, things were worse than ever. Evil will grow, wax, will wax worse and worse. The New Age has done nothing but grow exponentially since we came out of it 32 years ago. And yet David Jeremiah has a book called Agents of Apocalypse, Agents of Babylon. He doesn't mention any of the people that he mentioned before. He's hooked up with some of them. As a matter of fact, oh yeah, he's brought Roma Downey into the church, right into his own church sanctuary, up on the stand with him, Catholic New Ager. In his book, Invasion of Other Gods, David Jeremiah warned about John Roger. He was a man, I think his name was Hinckley, and he got, he got filled with this mystic traveler consciousness spirit guide. He founded Santa Monica University that Roma Downey graduated from. She's never repented. She's never renounced any of this stuff. Read the booklet in there that uh, my friend Greg Reed wrote called Confused by an Angel. She's, she's a total new ager, she, but she's like Leonard Sweet. Leonard Sweet who has done small group workshops with Rick Warren, uh, who has talked at the highest levels of many denominations. He's, he's reputed to be this kind of like really bright, clever guy who's written a lot of books. He said that the father of the New Age movement, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, was 20th century Christianity's major voice. 
in a book, Soul Tsunami, that has a cover endorsement by Rick Warren, Leonard Sweet lays it out. He says, to survive in the postmodern culture, you need to learn, one must learn to speak out of both sides of the mouth. Many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do wonderful works? Did we not hold wonderful revival meetings? And what did Jesus say? He said, depart from me, I don't know who you are. You, we need to do God's will, not our will, not our revivals. We don't conjure up revival by drawing circles like Pastor Mark Battison's Circle Maker book that can be found featured in just about every Christian bookstore. That's what the pagans did. That's what witches do. And yet we have Anne Graham Lotz endorsing praying in circles. We have Nancy Le Moss telling you to get chalk, draw a circle, get in it and pray, and we can start revival that way. You know, that's probably enough. I mean, I, I don't want to depress you all before you go to lunch, but these things are happening. <laughs> they, you already are depressed. I'm not depressing. <laughs> First Timothy 6, 19 to 21, Annette Capps, the daughter of Charles Capps, hyper-charismatic uh, preacher, has a, a little booklet called Quantum Faith, and she quotes Gary Zukoff, who's one of Gary, or, uh, Oprah Winfrey's spokespeople on her program. Brian McLaren talks about quantum physics. The, the physics, the quantum stuff is talked about in the shack. It's in the secret. Uh, it's in the physics of heaven, a book that largely comes out of Bethel Church. And they're trying to use quantum physics to prove that God is a force and that he is in everyone and everything. They haven't come out directly and said that yet, but that's where it's heading. And that scripture warns about science falsely so-called. That's gonna, I think that's going to be the linchpin. That's going to be the, are you ready for this? Have you, how many, have you heard this term how many times? Game changer. The game changer is God in everyone proven by science. Annette Capp's father, Charles Capp, said, you won't have to have faith in the future because science will prove your faith. That's where we're heading with all of this stuff. What is happening is becoming more and more outrageous as the church merges with the new age and merges with the world. It's the merging church, not the emerging church. What's emerging is the beast from the sea in Revelation 13. He rises from the sea. The synonym for rise is emerge. Merging with the teachings of the emerging Antichrist, an old hymn warns what happens when you drift too far from shore. Out on the perilous deep where dangers silently creep, storms so violently sweep, you're drifting too far from shore. Today the tempest rolls high and clouds overshadow the sky. Sure death is hovering nigh, you're drifting too far from shore. Why meet a terrible fate when joys abundantly wait? Turn back before it's too late, you're drifting too far from shore. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. God in everything will leaven the whole church into a new age. Why the men who, like David Jeremiah, who talked about it at one time are not, is not something we're going to fathom or figure out. It's just a fact. He's not warning anymore. He's doing the opposite. He's bringing people like Roma Downey into the church. He's grouping together with people like Rick Warren. Thomas Hardy wrote a poem right after the sinking of the Titanic. It was called Convergence of the Twain, Lines on the Loss of the Titanic. As the smart ship grew in stature, shape, and hue, in shadowy, silent distance grew the iceberg too. I kind of did a variation on that. As the smart church grew in stature, shape, and hue, in shadowy, silent distance grew the Antichrist too. I'm reminded of a line from a 60s Dylan song where he said, you know there's something happening here, but you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? These things are happening while people are just having a ball, getting titillated with lying signs and wonders. Last, I'll just conclude, last year, about this time, I was in Tampa, Florida. And Rodney Howard Brown, the Holy Ghost bartender who brought holy laughter to the Toronto Blessing, by the way, John Arnott, of that Toronto Blessing was one of those with James Robeson that Roger showed in that clip. Rodney Howard Brown has a, has a congregation of about 3,000. He's into revival. He brought his revival to Washington, D.C. the last two Fourth of Julys for a week or so. And there's Rodney Howard Brown speaking with Michelle Bachman, Congresswoman from Minnesota, 
Jonathan Kahn, um, the Harbinger author, um, the Senate chaplain, and, and others. So Rodney Howard Brown is on TV, and I had just flown in, and it was like midnight or something, but it was really 9 o'clock in California, so I watched. And what he's doing is he's shuffling around. He kind of walks around like this, and he says, you know, he says, you can gain the whole world and lose your family. And I went, oh, really? That's a little variation on that scripture. Then he said, you know, I'm going to have a grandchild. I don't, I don't know what they're going to name him. Maybe they'll name him Q. Maybe they'll name him Quantum. And I just sat there and I went, he can't contain himself. It's like the unholy spirit is just bursting at the seams to get quantum physics out there, to get the revival going. And there he is in Washington, D.C., in Constitution Hall. And it's being referred to by Bill Johnson's church and others in the so-called New Apostolic Reformation as one of our modern-day revivals. I've got a booklet. It's a reprint of an article I wrote 20 years ago called Holy, Holy Laughter or Strong Delusion. The manifestations that were in that holy laughter phenomenon were ones that I was involved with, with the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh Hindu, you know, Indian movement that I was involved in. My wife was with Muktananda. We weren't there in India, but these were the manifestations that Kundalini spirit that would come through. We're not being warned about the, you, you, have you heard the word counterfeit lately? That was all over the place when I came into the faith. It was in Johanna's and, you know, Carol's and Dave Hunt's books. I mean, counterfeit. There's a real, there's a counterfeit. Now it's just kind of like, hey, we're going to have revival. Hey, worldwide, Leonard Sweet, the world's on the cusp of the world's greatest spiritual awakening. We're not contending for the faith at leadership level. We're not fighting the good fight. We're not standing fast. We're not continuing in the word. But we will. And I think our witness in the future is going to be one word alone. No, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to stand with the true Jesus Christ. We used to say, when I, when I was uh, in the New Age, you have your truth and I have mine. Well, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And what's really being said is, by those on the other side, you have your Jesus and I have mine. That's what we see with Jesus calling. That's what we see in the new age. And we see a new Jesus being redefined, reinvented within the so-called evangelical church. The apostle Paul warned in 2 Corinthians 11, he told the Corinthians, he chided them. He said, if another Jesus is preached, you might just go along with it. That's what's happening. We're being convinced by people like Sarah Young in her book, Jesus Calling, that we need to have a conversation with Jesus. We need to hear from him directly. Or we're really not authentic Christians. That's the implication. Have you heard from Jesus lately? You haven't? You guys doing okay? Your family, you know, problems at home? I mean, it's like, it's almost like if you're not having that encounter, one encounter changes everything, something's wrong. So thank God for God's word. Um, thank God that he's told us these things ahead of time so we don't have to be deceived. We stand on his word. We stand in his truth. And I think we need to kind of batten down the hatches because I think we're, we're into some pretty rough waters. And I think we're going to start feeling it more and more, those that don't go along with this rather large deception that's taking place. So thank you very much. And I guess we're about ready for lunch. All right. Well, thank you, Warren. Now, if any of you wanted to have a nice sit-down lunch, you won't be able to because Warren went over. <laughs> Kidding. It's a little joke. So he started a little bit late. Anyway, um, there, there's a place down here where they have all their books and things like that. You know, I am so sorry, and I want to say to, uh, Pope, to both Johanna and uh, to Carol, uh, I didn't ask you to bring any of your stuff with you. Did you, by chance? Do you have any of it with you? Okay. Okay. Um, if you don't mind, if I could put upon you to do this, if you don't mind going down there, um, you can find out about how to uh, to take a look through the things that they have, uh, their ministry uh, links pages, because they're very much uh, right in the, I mean, they're the unspoken people in the room, although you mentioned them. Uh, they have everything to do with what we're talking about here today. So if you don't know who uh, who Carol and, and uh, who Johanna are, um, 
you can meet them in the in the room down the hall. You, are you okay with that? Going down there and having people meet you down there? It's too late now if you do. I mean, it's a, no reason to object. So uh, as you have your conversations at lunch, I want to I want to make sure that I mention this because I'm sure some of you there was a, a some real cringeworthy moments during what Warren was talking about because he mentioned people that may be familiar to us by name. Um, maybe some that you don't recognize uh, as being part of Calvary, but when he mentioned Greg and when he mentioned Steve, people may wonder, you're a Calvary Chapel, how in the world would you let him say those kind of things? Uh, I have to make sure that I'm very careful about this and say, look, if we didn't know them as being part of this association, we would have been appalled by that. But just because they're associated with us doesn't mean that it's something that we shouldn't be very, very carefully considering because it's dangerous stuff. And so, you know, again, my, my affiliation is to the Word of God above everything. And that part was, I don't say it for that. Communication with the dead, and, and I, I can't even begin to understand the level of their hurt uh, for having to deal with something like that. It, it's something that nobody could be able to say, I know how you feel unless you've had it happen to you. But that doesn't dismiss the problem. And so uh, as far as that is concerned, yeah, I may get a, a bunch of flack, who knows, but I will ultimately say, find fault with why we're concerned about such things. So again, your, your discussion at lunch, just something to throw out there. When people say we shouldn't be talking about these kind of things, I would like to give another uh, part of this to you and say, when you consider how much Paul wrote, remember that Paul was writing his epistles with within like 30 years of the founding of the church and by that time there was so much trouble in the church he was having to warn it constantly the churches that he was writing to were ones that he helped to found and so they were half that age at the at the oldest maybe 10 15 years old some of them within a year or two of the founding of them he's having to tell them about their error and to correct it so for the life of me i don't understand why it is that we are having to apologize for saying we should be evaluating this stuff 24-7 and it should never end. So the fact that there must be warning means that the standard is the word. We are to compare what's happening in the church and I'm, I'm sick to death of hearing about compromise and all the rest because it would be like Paul saying, well, you know, those Gnostics, we don't agree on everything, but they've got some good ideas. Instead, he wanted to see them destroyed spiritually speaking, and, and their work. So I'm, I'm done with the idea of go along to get along in the spirit of unity. It is unity of the spirit based upon what we know to be true. So as these guys have already shown, unity for the sake of unity is exactly what the devil's peddling. So make sure that you understand that. And yeah, discuss this stuff. Everything that you've heard from these guys, if you cannot prove it scripturally, then please have a word with them.